Your bulletin reads Proverbs that we are, had prepared or I had planned to teach this morning, six, but uh, I'm not going to do that. Uh, there is a story of the success of the movie Godfather 1 and Godfather 2 uh, that the public and all of Hollywood demanded more of Francis Ford Coppola and Marlon Brando together. So it wasn't but two years distance from that second Godfather production that we had a new movie, The Apocalypse Now. And uh, Brando was to play this uh, general that had gone off the reservation and he was to be this uh, more mature man, rather chiseled uh, in his physique, living out there in the wilds north of Vietnam. But Coppola began to get these um, rumors and he began to become very nervous because he had heard that Brando had put on about 65 pounds and it didn't fit the character that he was to portray. So he inquired about that. Marlon, is everything okay? I hear you're putting on weight. No, there's nothing to worry about, he told him. And then came the day for the shooting and Marlon showed up about 75 pounds overweight. And Coppola, pulling his hair out, screamed, Marlon, what do you have to say for yourself? And he said, I lied. <laughs> I really had planned to teach the Proverbs, but um, I normally do a devotional once a year, uh, just something different. Uh, and I hadn't done that in a long time and particularly because of the layoff with COVID. So I decided over the 4th of July weekend, since I was all alone, that I would just put together some thoughts that I had about a passage that means a great deal to me. And so rather than Proverbs this morning, I'd like for you to look with me to Genesis chapter 32. It is, of course, the story of Jacob coming back home. He had been with Laban for a number of years. He now has wives and children. And the Lord specifically had told him in a dream, it's time to go home. So pack up and leave. And that's what he does. He's on his sojourn back. That's Genesis 32. And he receives encouragement along the way. Verse 2, there's the angels appearing as men. And we don't know exactly how they appeared as men, but he recognized them to be angels. And so he names the place Mahanim. But the real drama of this chapter is about facing his brother, Esau. Esau, who the last time he saw him was seething and ready to kill him. So as he gets closer to the land of promise, he sends messengers and he sends animals in waves as gifts to his brothers. The messengers return with news. Esau is on his way and he has 400 men with him. Verse 7, Jacob grows cold and afraid. Esau has now occupied all the capacity of his brain, and he is terrified. He divides his animals. He divides his camp. Verse 8, strategy. Now make a mental note right here, utterly worthless. Verses 9, 10, and 11, here's something of value. He prays, 
He prays earnestly as a man afraid and terrified would pray. And look at the end of verse 11. Here's the crux of it all. Deliver me from the hand of my brother Esau, for I fear him. Verse 12, he reminds God of his promises, and that's a great way to pray. Again, reminding God of his circumstances. And then he busies himself again, beginning in verse 13 through verse 23. More strategy, shifting, organizing, moving, this and that, animals, Wives, children. Verse 12, he reminds God of his promises. But he now finds himself, verse 24, all alone. Everyone is gone. And now, the real zinger in the text is he comes under attack. And rather suddenly, you know, for all the portrayals of Jacob hanging out with his mother in the tents and doing the cooking, the scriptures portray Jacob as a man of great physical prowess. Genesis 29.10, he rolls away a stone from a well that would take three or four Bedouins to do, but he does it by himself. His formidable strength is very important to the study now at hand. So we emphasize his strength. The attacker realizes that he cannot overpower him. So he merely touches his hip. And that's where we pick up the story in earnest, verse 25. That word to touch is really a study unto itself. We find the word for the first time in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 3, the woman dialoguing with the serpent in the garden, that we are not allowed even to touch the tree in the midst of that pristine paradise. We find the word again as Satan coming to the Lord God and requesting permission to touch everything that Job owned. It's the word that is used of the calling of Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah chapter 6, that God had touched his mouth. And the same in Jeremiah chapter 1. The calling of the prophet there. God touched his mouth. Literally, the word means to lay a finger upon. But if you do an analysis of the use of the word, with the exception of the woman in the garden, this to lay a finger on implies supernatural power, supernatural ability. And it gives us a clue as to who this visitor at the Jabbok River actually was. Verse 26, now Jacob in pain. But he remains the model of tenacity. You know, they say regarding great athletes that physical strength and ability is one thing, but the ability between your ears is what's really necessary to succeed athletically. Look at this man. He requests a blessing. Just holding on now. But it's not granted. Isn't that amazing? Rather, 
Instead, verses 27 and 28, the attacker renames him. No longer who or what you were in the past, Jacob. Now, Israel. Now, there are major interpretive questions in Genesis chapter 32. What is verse 27? The point of that name being changed? Verse 28, what is the struggle with God and man? What does that mean? There's the word overcoming, prevailing, in some texts, what does that mean? Doesn't seem to me, looking at the story, that Jacob prevailed over anything. And then, of course, the big one, the biggest of all in the text, is Israel. What does that mean? I don't want to get sidetracked. I don't want to get sidetracked at all in the interpretive questions. That's not the purpose here. This is not a full uh, exposition of Genesis 32. Rather, not what Israel means, but what I want us to do for the next few minutes is look at what Israel does. Because to me, this is the clearest picture of explaining your life and mine now in Christ Jesus. Jacob had gone face to face with the living God. But now, as Israel, he's going face to face with his brother who wanted to kill him. Esau now certainly superior. Jacob, we now know, has been diminished. And not to be missed, diminished because supernaturally he had specifically been touched by God alone. I can't tell you how many times in my spiritual life, I have been on my knees crying out to the Lord. One prayer. It is you who have brought me here. And it is you who have made me weak. I guess that really is what drew me to the passage in the first place. So let's frame the issue. Going into chapter 33, it's why the whole subject of his physical strength was so important to the story, because now you see he has none. It's been taken or removed from him. Unable to extricate himself from his present dilemma, now powerless, really, from the hip that was strong, ordinary, when he was born, and been that way all of his life. But now look, after the touch, made weak. So, chapter 33, Verse 1, we have Esau bearing down now upon him. And all of his mercenaries riding with him. I think of Psalm 139, verse 5. David cries out to the Lord, You have hemmed me in, behind and before. David saw himself as the object between a vice and God was doing the cranking closer and closer and closer 
in. Verse 2, more strategy. He lines up the family, utterly worthless. Verse 3, now out in front of the family. He's bowing several times, seven times, the perfect number. Utterly worthless. The man of strength is now the man of weakness. Esau is coming with 400 mercenaries. He has an army of women and children. They will overrun him in a matter of seconds. Remember back a few weeks ago, we discussed, for better purposes, a decision that David had to make in 2 Samuel 24, in which he was being punished for numbering the fighting men of Israel. And you remember, David chose the plague, the three-day plague, and he gives us the reason for doing that. He says, because I don't want to fall into the hands of men. David, the great warrior on the battlefield, had seen the worst of men. He had seen their ruthlessness. And he had seen their cruelty. And he wanted none of it. He chose the plague. Please mark it well right here that Jacob, now Israel, is in the hands of men. I wonder if you would think about taking the odds for Jacob to Las Vegas this morning. I think you would find many people taking action on that bet. I think they would line all the way down the Las Vegas Strip and probably around some of those giant casinos too. Oh, you could make book on that, betting Jacob against Esau. Here he is. In the hands of men. Now, beginning in verse 4, chapter 33, I want you to see this from Jacob's eyes. We are now looking through his set of eyes. Here they come. And faster than you can blink those eyes, here they are on him. But look what happens. The brother who said he was going to kill him is now dismounted and running toward him. He embraces him, flinging himself in a volley of emotion upon his brother, Jacob. This is actually in the plural, in the Hebrew text. Hugging, kissing, the close embrace. The lexicon says the plural heightens the emotion of Esau in the story. Verse 5, then Esau looking around and seeing the extended family inquires, And just as planned and just as rehearsed and strategized, here they come, they bow. But very important and not to be missed, look at these opening words of Israel to his brother. He talks of the grace of God, of all that God had done in his life while he was away. Grace. Grace. That's who we are. 
That's what we are. Products of grace. And just as rehearsed, verses 6 and 7, here come the handmaids with their sons, and likewise Leah, and then Rachel. And then verse 8, Esau inquires, what was all that processional of animals? What was that all about? And again, listen to the voice of Israel. He has recorded words here that I might find, and there's our familiar word from Proverbs, favor. But you see, Jacob, Israel, it's already been poured out. That's what the word favor means. God has worked in the heart of another to grant you favor. And again, that normative text that we've referenced so many times, there is Ruth in the midst of that field of Boaz, and that shadow of a man comes across her, and she inquires, Who am I? that I would find favor in your eyes, for I'm a foreigner. Now, that's significant. Because you see, the man Jacob, all of his life, had always been working the angles. He was a man of deception, trickery. And if necessary, He lies. But look at him here. Look and listen to his talk. He's straightforward. He's honest. He is what the Proverbs would say, conducting his affairs with justice. This is a changed man. Verse 9, this is why all of this activity and strategy was worthless because Esau says, I have plenty. Because now, what Jacob, now Israel, has found that moments before his seeming weakness now has everything working for him. At the close of Roger Steer's book, summarizing the life of George Mueller, he wrote a sentence that I have kept with me for years and years. Steer writes, when a man makes his chief business to love and serve the Lord, he makes all of his circumstances his servants. That's Jacob, and that's what's happened here to Israel. Now, I want to take the camera angle now from behind his eyes, looking at his brother, and I want to go upstairs to the Goodyear blimp and look down on these proceedings, because you see, the dialogue now is unimportant. The words Don't tell us anything. We will see what we need to see visually. And I want you to see it high above. Here it is. What would we be seeing now? We see Israel leaning on his staff, limping along, if you will. And we see his brother standing in front of him, full of strength, and surrounded by 400 mercenaries. That's what we would see. And then we watch Israel walk right past him. 
And we watch Israel walk right in the midst of, or better, through all of those combatants. If there was a good reporter in the ancient Near East, maybe there there is one, they're not here today, but if there was one, maybe they would saunter up alongside of Jacob and pull out their little notepad with a pen and begin furiously writing for a comment and asking Israel just exactly what went on here. Explain this to me. And I think Jacob would have described it as David did in Psalm 44, verse 22. That's quoted by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8. And here it is, describing the new life and the changes that we now possessed by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. We face death all day long and are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. David's words. But it is the commentary of the Apostle Paul that really arrests our attention. His explanation of David's quote of Psalm 44. It's Romans 8.37, and here is what The apostle writes, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Now, the other morning, I rolled over at about 2.30 a.m. And I said to myself, Gosh, you dummy, if you were really a good student, you would have done some work on that word to conquer. But I'm a dummy, and so I didn't. Rushing out the door, always behind, always behind, I reached up and grabbed my commentary on the book of Romans from John Murray, and I turned there. And I looked specifically at Romans 8.37. And it's good that it happened just exactly that way. Because these words of John Murray are simply magnificent. He writes, More than conquerors, what is stressed is the superlative A victory. The victory is always the case. Here are the apostles' words. In all of these things, unqualified. In every encounter. In every adversity. Even with all the hostility. Even up to the point of death itself. The victory is ours. One word sentence. Unbelievable. That's what happened here. Now I ask you, is it any wonder, is it any wonder that Paul tells us that what he has learned in his pilgrimage? 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in verse 9, that when he finds himself at the point of greatest weakness in his life, he finds himself supernaturally empowered in those moments. He had learned that and seen it so often in his own life that he actually goes on and says that he boasts of his weakness now. 
So strong is the Lord in his life. The touch that had made him weak makes him strong. The touch that made you and me weak. You've lost children. You've lost a husband. You've lost your wives. You've been ravaged by disease. The economy has failed. You've lost your job. You have been in all sorts of trials, dilemmas, difficulties. And that's your spiritual life. The life that you now possess in Jesus Christ. Because you see, He singled you out. He singled me out for the touch. The supernatural touch. So here is this life. It is weakness. Now made strong. And now, says the Apostle Paul in Romans 8... Now conquering, actually, through it all. So, the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 32, he writes, and what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. And then he summarizes that magnificent attribute of history with these words, from weakness made strong. That is now your life. So let me exhort you. Stop relying on yourself. It will do you no good. Your strategies will not get you anywhere. Not anymore. Shrewd tactics. He has called you to a higher life. And here it is. A life of dependence. Total dependence. A life really of weakness. Total weakness. And looking at Jacob, now Israel, limping, limping from this point forward. And as you do limping, you will see, you'll see exactly what Jacob saw. Victory after victory after victory. Conquered by him, not by you, not by your power, by his power. And you will prevail in the campaigns called life from one mountaintop to the next, to the next, to the next. And those are your days to come. Not your days. His days, his days that he numbered for you and he has planned for you, that you would live a life of overcoming. That's the word. What did that word overcoming, prevail mean? It certainly didn't look like Jacob prevailed over anything at the Jabbok. But you see, that was in the moment. And history records a completely different story. And that's your life. 
and that's mine. So, I can't tell you how many times I have been on my knees saying again, Lord, you are the one who has brought me here. And Lord, you are the one who has made me weak. And now I understand that prayer that I had uttered over and over and over through the years. This is the Christian life. And this is the power that goes with it. Let's pray. Uh, Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. We're so grateful that you show yourself always all-sufficient in each and every occasion of life. We are so lost at times. The valleys are so dark and so deep, and we really don't understand really who we are, where we are, But we have this text, this text that is a light to our path and will carry us along through all of the frenetic energy of our daily routines. It's all to you, Lord. And we are your people who by your grace and grace alone conquer. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.